Welcome into Cover One Buffalo, everyone. Nate Geary here, Cover One contributor Robert Quinn joining me, the uh, the better looking Quinn. What's up, buddy? How are you? Doing good. How you doing, Nate? I'm doing well, man. We uh, are exactly eight days away from the start of training camp. The NFL season technically started today. The Baltimore Ravens reporting a training camp. So football's in the air. Uh, college football is right around the corner as well. So uh, it's exciting time, uh, especially for those people like in our profession, where we get bored this time of year because we're searching for things to talk about, to write about. Uh, the stories start to write in uh, to do themselves here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even I was talking to Eric at cover one about that and just these dog days here waiting for camp there's nothing to write about um especially the bills so it'll be nice to see the guys finally take the field the new team and you know get things going so before we get into today's topics uh, i want to remind everybody they can download the, and they should download the cover one app up at the app store uh itunes on itunes and obviously the android store or google store uh to download the app and obviously you can check us out there get push notifications uh when the guys come out with new work which is uh which is always great. So today's show uh, is going to be, you know, where we sort of, uh, Aaron and I have really gone through every position group uh, we can this offseason, kind of giving you the rundown of what each of those are going to look like. Um, so now Rob and I are going to really sort of look at um, the situation in terms of the team going into the training camp right now. Um, but we wanted to take a look at the 2014 draft class, specifically Kelvin Benjamin. He's part of that draft class. Considered right now maybe one of the best draft classes for wide receivers of all time, it's the same draft class the Bills traded up in uh, to, to draft Sammy Watkins. And uh, obviously, being no longer being on the team and getting paid in the offseason by the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, he sort of slots into this group of good young receivers that have just been getting paid. So we'll talk a little bit about um, where Kelvin Benjamin slots into all that um, and, and kind of how we expect him to, um, to fit in in the offseason because he is up for a contract this season. Um, following his fifth year option. So we're also going to get into the 2017 draft class. If you didn't check it out, um, Sal Capaccio or guy sale at WGR550.com did an article uh, basically previewing what we can expect or what we should expect from the 2017 draft class. So last year's draft class in their second season. So we'll go through each guy, kind of give you our expectations um, for them on the 2018 season and how they look to uh, contribute this season. And then we want to get a little bit of the Le'Veon Bell situation in Pittsburgh um, where obviously he declined to sign a five-year, uh, like $70 million deal where he was going to get paid $16 million a year, but not a lot of guaranteed money. And the word is that he may have played his last down at the end of this season um, for Pittsburgh. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about how that might affect the 2019 salary cap and the Bills being one of those teams at the top of the league next year in terms of cap room. And then we'll talk a little about Darrell Rivas as he retired today. Uh, so we've got a full docket for the show um, Rob, any uh, before we get going, any uh, any pieces you want to promo before we get going that might be up at CoverOne.net? Um, I'm working on something right now that I did the past couple of years. Actually, Pat Kerwin with uh, SiriusXM put together a list of – there's like 12 questions that he says teams need to answer about their depth and um, whether that will determine if they're playoff contenders and can really push deep. So I'm doing something on that. And then something a post on uh, why the offense can actually get better than it was last year that I'm working on as well. So that'll be, well, awesome. I'll tell you, I'll be looking forward to that second one because uh, <laughs> it'll be interesting to see. I mean, obviously we we've talked a lot about um, the worries on the offensive side of the ball um, in terms of who's going to be playing quarterback, who's going to be protecting the quarterback and more importantly, who's going to be making plays for the quarterback. So uh, that'll be an interesting art article. You'll want to take a look, of course, cover one.net. And if you uh, have the app on your phone, you'll get live updates when, uh, when it drops. So make sure you, uh, you download it and check us out. Of course, at cover1.net. So, Rob, let's hop into this 2014 draft class um, of wide receivers. I saw something pretty crazy uh, on the Twitter.com machine. I'm going to pull up on my phone right now. It was the um, the current salaries of the 2014 class, um, Odell Beckham Jr., Kelvin Benjamin, and I guess we could throw Jordan Matthews in there as well. Outstanding. Um, everyone else in this class has seen multi-year deals um, really the lowest paid receiver, Paul Richardson, uh, which is kind of crazy to think about five years, $40 million in Washington uh, to be basically what I would think is probably their number one or number two receiver in Washington with Alex Smith. So let's start at the top, Rob. Um, and, and sort of, I'll give you, I'll give you a rundown of some of these numbers, which I just think are sometimes crazy. Sammy Watkins, three years, 48 million. Mike Evans, five years, 82.2 million. Brandon Cooks, this is all kind of stemming from the Brandon Cooks deal that was signed two days ago. Brandon Cooks signed for five years, $80 million before playing a snap in L.A. 
while they've got Aaron Donald on the shelf. Interesting one there. Jarvis Landry, five years, $75 million. Devontae Adams, four for 58 Allen Robinson, three for 42 Marquise Lee, four for 34 And, uh, again, this is all without Odell Beckham Jr. and Kelvin Benjamin really um, getting paid. They're each on the last year of their rookie contracts. Let's start with Odell Beckham and maybe as a starting point of where we can sort of slot Kelvin Benjamin. I believe that Odell Beckham probably gets paid the most in this class, which is probably going to tell you something. I would think probably in the $90 million range. Yeah, I don't think there's a question Odell is going to be the highest paid. I mean, if I was him and you're seeing the Brandon Cooks deal, you, he's pissed off. I mean, he's <laughs> going to be playing for about eight point something million dollars this year. And um, final year of the deal, and his final year of the deal, he's had like 90 catches, 1,300 yards, nine or 10 touchdowns a year every season. So, um, but that Watkins deal, three for 48, there's 12 drafted in the first two rounds. Pretty much all of them have played for different teams almost, but um It'll be interesting for Kelvin Benjamin, really, because he needs to, to kind of step up in a year where with a rookie quarterback. So he's kind of behind the eight ball, I think. He's certainly behind the eight ball. And in terms of Kelvin Benjamin, what I worry about is, um, you know, last season under when Tyrod Taylor was the quarterback, I think a guy like Kelvin Benjamin just really didn't jive with what Tyrod did well. Um, Tyrod's not a quarterback that's going to throw the ball up into coverage and Kelvin Benjamin is not the kind of receiver that's going to just run all over the field and create openings and be able to create a ton of separation. So he needs a quarterback that's going to be willing to trust him a little bit more. More importantly, they need a quarterback who's willing to throw him jump balls, um, balls up high where he can take advantage of his size. I said this last year um, when the Bills acquired him, and, and to a certain extent I do really believe this, that Kelvin Benjamin is the closest thing to Rob Gronkowski that the league has outside of Rob Gronkowski. He doesn't play the same position, I understand, but you're talking about a guy who's six foot five, six foot six, 250, 245 pounds, can box you out, is super athletic, can jump out of the gym, and more importantly, has great hands. This is a team that has to utilize Calvin Benjamin this year. First of all, if he's going to get paid, but that aside, if this offense is going to be successful, he needs to be in that 65 to 75 catch range this year. He in the short-term area, in, in, in the short yardage area, is still a weapon because of his size and his ability to box out defenders. So how do they this year – is this all dependent on who's playing quarterback and how they get him the football? You know, I think you made a great point that, it, that Tyrod Taylor really didn't um, get the most out of him because, like you said, he's not going to throw – he wanted his receivers wide open. He's not going to take those chances. I mean, he protected the ball, um, but that was more so due to – really being conservative and taking off. I think Eric um, posted a stat against man coverage, how poor he was. But Kelvin, I think, will be better with Josh Allen. A guy's going to take risks and sling it. But um, with Cam Newton, we saw the same thing, kind of similar. But um, with a rookie in that offense, and everyone knows he's going to be the number one option, we'll see if he can do it. But I think staying healthy is going to be the biggest factor in that. Yeah, that was the one thing last year. Obviously, he comes in, the L.A. Chargers game happens where he, gets, he makes the first play of the game and then is out for the next three or four weeks with that uh, – I was like it was a meniscus injury during right. that game. But, um, yeah, that was disappointing because really all the, for the rest of the season you could sort of see that it was laboring. Uh, I, I, to be honest with you, I was pretty impressed um, on a new team and a new organization, um, one that he doesn't really owe anything to, one that brought him in you know, on a trade – was able to sort of play through those injuries, but show that he was willing to be on the field, even though he wasn't 100%. Yeah, and that's got to be a testament to really Brandon Bean knowing him from Carolina and the type of player and work ethic and everything that he has. So I think they're comfortable with him as a player and a person that he's going to be that guy. But as far as monetary value, that's something that's going to be really tough to gauge. And um, But like you said, that injury really – you could we didn't get to see the best of him. So hopefully yeah. – and it's like one of those things, too. There probably isn't another position in all of sports, not just football, that relies more on another player for their success than the wide receiver position in football. I mean, right now, he's not in an ideal situation to go out and get paid this offseason where he's got a guy that he knows he's going to get 75 catches. He's going to get 115 targets. Like, that's just not... First of all, we don't know that that's going to be the offense that's in place. Is this an offense that's going to have a wide receiver have 115, 120 targets? I don't know. Uh, we just don't know what we're going to get from Brian Dable at this point, um, especially in the passing offense. And more importantly, who's playing quarterback? If it's Nathan Peterman, to be honest with you, I think 
in terms of best case scenario for Kelvin Benjamin, it might be Nathan Peterman playing quarterback because he at least early showed last year um, that he was looking for Kelvin Benjamin early and often in games. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, like you said, even in the, the Chargers game, we laugh at him and it's it was pretty atrocious, one of the worst in games in history. But he was still going and attacking coverages and th throwing it up there. But that's something that Tyrod Taylor never did. And you commend him for that. But at the same time, I don't I think that the coaches are going to want Allen there. And I do think Allen would be the better uh, quarterback for him just because of that similarity to Cam Newton, where he's going to be able to make plays and just sling it downfield. And because I think Kelvin's big plays are really going to come on the, the broken ones where Allen's going to have to roll out, kind of look downfield and find uh, – somewhere where he could just throw it to Kelvin, he can go up and get it. And, you know, I think, too, I, I think maybe trying to evaluate Kelvin Benjamin this year or really in general based on the volume of catches maybe isn't exactly where you're going to find his value. I think if this year the Bills figure out a way to make the playoffs or be a successful team, an eight-win, a seven-win team, I think that's a success for the, what the talent level of the roster is. That a huge success for me could still be Kelvin Benjamin getting – 55 catches for 790 yards or 800 yards and 12 touchdowns. Like if he can be a legitimate red zone threat, he's going to create value for himself on the open market. But more importantly, he's going to have maybe the most important role on this team, a guy that can be dependable in the red zone. They just haven't had that. Yeah. If you can be, uh, make plays in those situational football and that those situations and third downs and in the red zone, that that'll be just as important. I mean, the Sean McCoy had 59 catches last year and that led the team. So, Getting a guy that's going to have 90 or something, we're not really used to that. I think, what was it, Stevie Johnson probably right. the last person who even came close. But, um, I mean, Benjamin is going to be a guy who's going to have those slants, curls, hitches, and then the occasional big play, I think, where he kind of breaks free downfield. But he's not a game changer, like you said. But in the red zone, that's where he's going to make his money. Yeah, and I mean, where he potentially slots in, you know, I, I think you're probably looking at – the range of Odell Beckham anywhere between 16 and $20 million um, per season. I think that's, that's probably pretty fair. I think Kelvin Benjamin probably fits in somewhere around the 10, 11, 12 area. Um, I think, and I think that's if all goes well this year, that that's what he could potentially demand on the market. And with the amount of cap space that the bills are going to have available to them this year, or next year, if they're able to roll over 10 or so million, which it looks like they could potentially do um, with about 13 and a half in space currently, as we speak, I think right around that number. Um, and then whatever they could potentially roll over to next year is Charles Clay around next year is LaShawn McCoy around next year is Gary Hughes around next year. And you start to see a roster that if they can maneuver some of the larger end contracts, they already have on the books um, and all that dead money coming off the books. This is a team that's going to have a lot of capital to work with next year. And I think maybe Calvin Benjamin becomes one of those guys that they focus on. But you also have to realize that Calvin Benjamin, in probably the best case scenario, isn't your number one receiver, right? Right. Right. I think he's a, a complimentary guy that you can't, that is a high end 1B mm -hmm. target, maybe. But he's not a guy like a, like a Sammy Watkins or an Odell Beckham where that guy is going to get 10, 15 targets a game and you you force him the ball like that. Um, plus, he's 27 years old. You look at Cooks and Watkins and Odell, those guys are 20, 25 too, so that might be a factor. But, I mean, with $76 million right now, and then like you said with the additional contracts, they could really be doing whatever they want next offseason and be, be fine. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked about, and, and what I've talked about with Eric a lot, is how they're going to potentially – fill the offense up next year. I think that they really, really focused on their their needs defensively to try to really shore up a unit that was close. The offense, and, and I'm sure you'll probably write about this in your piece when it's up at cover1.net, with the offense, it, there's a clear, they're clearly further behind than the defense. They have a lot more areas they need to improve in. Wide receiver clearly being one of them. But I, when I look at this offense as a whole and I look at Calvin Benjamin, I don't see him as a problem. Um, I see him as a guy that maybe needs a compliment on the other side. I don't know that Zay Jones is the type of compliment that you need with Kelvin Benjamin. I, th I do think that if you're going to have Zay Jones and Kelvin Benjamin on the field at the same time, they do need a, a guy with game-breaking speed, someone that can take the top off of defenses because those two players will, I think, struggle at times off the, off the ball with physical corners. Although I don't know that Kelvin Benjamin is going to struggle too many times with physical corners. He's a physical specimen. Yeah, you can, I can't argue with that at all. I mean, those are guys, like you said, they're complimentary ideally pieces in your offense but 
they don't have that speed guy that's going to open them up. I mean, last year they had Deontay Thompson that was their big play guy. That's kind of kind of sad when you think about it. But if you have Brandon Tates and Deontay Thompson's as your guys that are going to scheme open for Benjamin to get open underneath, that's not ideal. Hopefully Dable can do something with that. But, I mean, it's, it's an ugly offense right now. But going back to the defense, like you said, I mean, the defense is set up for – years if you if these guys pan out with trey um defensive tackles uh milano Edmonds from front to back they're really set so the pieces are in place for them to move over to offense and get that going well i'm glad you brought up you know guys like trey white and matt milano because we wanted to talk about this 2017 draft class and uh we'll promo sales piece up at wgr550.com um you can follow him on twitter at sales sports he put his article about what his expectations and what to maybe expect this year from the 20. 17 draft class, the draft class from uh, from last year. And I mean, obviously, I think we can start right at the top with Tredavious White in year two. Um, you know, and, and I talked to, to Ian Wharton, who does um, the, a quarter, the cornerback handbook, and he's with Bleacher Report, and he does really great breakdowns of the cornerback position. And what I asked him a couple weeks ago when he was on with me on Sports Talk Saturday is, you know, have we maybe seen what Tredavious White's ceiling is? Um, did he reach that ceiling last year, or is there another level to Tredavious White's game? And I think this year will be a big test of that because teams know now what he brings on the field. But to me, Rob, I think we could potentially see a step forward from Tredavious because of the scheme that he's running. It's so cornerback friendly and really fits his skill set to a T. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think you could be more happy at the prospects for a player on the Bills than Tredavious White. I mean, for a guy to come in and – Makes Stephon Gilmore not um, ex- uh, expendable last year. They did. I, I mean, Darby, he, I mean, Ryan right, Darby. Darby, right, right, but, right. Um, making that him expendable in training camp and then coming in day one, being that top guy, and the way he performed and got better each and every week um, was just ridiculous for a young kid like that to kind of watch grow and develop into not only a player from an athleticism standpoint, but really from a technique and matching up with top receivers almost week to week basis, like against the Bucks, Mike Evans, um, AJ Green, he, he limited those guys and he probably should, should have been the defensive rookie of the year. Yeah. And I mean, you go back, Rob, for me, anyways, you go back to the 2016 season from 2016 to 2017, and you saw them completely remake their secondary. And I don't think anybody would have thought you get rid of Aaron Williams um, and all of a sudden you're strong, your, your safety position becomes your best position on your team. But you end up with Jordan Poyer, a guy who sort of hadn't really made his mark in the league as a, as a, as a safety or really as a starter. He comes here in Buffalo, and now they're talking, is he going to take the step up? This should be a Pro Bowl caliber player. Then you got Micah Hyde who comes over as sort of your gadget player, sort of does everything in the secondary. How much do those guys, in your opinion, like give a guy like Trey White, especially his rookie season, the confidence to maybe play with some more aggressiveness and maybe to, to, to take chances because he knows what he has in the back end? You know, that probably was a, an advantage, I mean, for a whole new uh, unit in there because it really was an entirely new group of players and the entire secondary was overhauled. So, I mean, those guys were learning and growing together. So nobody was really established as the top guy. And they all probably fed off each other and they got to grow as one another. So, I mean, the communication and everything, that had to play a factor. But I think having two vets like that behind you as a rookie is invaluable and it had to play a huge role in Tredavious' success. But, I mean, back at LSU, the awards there that he had, um, you knew what kind of person you were getting when they drafted him. But I don't think anybody could have expected how well he was going to play right off the bat. Yeah, there's you know? no way. Uh, and, and, and especially really from training camp, I think everybody saw it in training camp. And I think the coaching staff saw it in training camp and immediately thought to themselves, well, I, we can move on from a guy like Ronald Darby. And, and, and even in the same conversation, they're, they're not, you know, Deion Dawkins – their starting left tackle. He, his play early on in in the absence of Cordy Glenn, did more than just solidify their left tackle for the next whatever it is decade. But it created financial flexibility for this organization to say, listen, we can move a guy like Cordy Glenn who we don't feel fits into the culture we are trying to build in terms of his availability on the field and what he's doing to stay on the field. They just a lot of the conversations I have with Sale is 
they didn't feel like he was doing enough to make himself available at times last year. So they move on from from a guy like Cordy Glennon, but more importantly, they move on from that salary. And you have a guy like Deion Dawkins on a second round rookie contract as your franchise left tackle going into his second year. What would you say your expectations are for Dawkins in year two, knowing we saw at least flashes of brilliance in year one, especially on the ground in terms of run blocking? Yeah, he was he was really impressive. And like you said, with the financial flexibility that they got from that, I think you can't um, not acknowledge that when talking about the future of the Bills offense, because that's a lot of money that Cordy Glenn was eating up to really not play at the level that he was at when he was on the field, when he signed that contract, but then even being available. And with a new coaching staff coming in, Dawkins, Dawkins kind of had the, the head start, especially going back to camp when Glenn was out with that foot thing. And um, then he comes in and he's playing all over the place, that guard, tackle, so he showed off that versatility. Um, as a run blocker, I'm excited. But pass protection, he got better as the season went on. And I know Eric could probably attest to that more than I can, um, just from the, watching the film more. But I'm, I didn't really see too much where Dawkins was actually just getting physically overpowered. He looks impressive to me. Yeah, there wasn't any plays that stuck out to me last year where it looked like he was a liability, you know, where he's a young guy, young rookie. Not only that, but a rookie from Temple. This isn't a guy who's going up against SEC talent every week and is sort of ready for that speed of the game. He really, his transition to me was the most impressive. And, and sort of on the opposite side, the transition for Zay Jones wasn't as smooth. And I, to me, and I don't know, Rob, maybe you can attest to this too. I go back to that Carolina Week 2 game last year, the last play of the game where Tyrod Taylor – maybe just misses Zay Jones or maybe Zay Jones just misses the catch. Whatever you want to say, I, you know, I, everyone's entitled to their opinion on that play. But I think that really sort of set the tone for the remainder of the season. And then you go into that Jets game where he finally looks like he's taking that step. He gets that touchdown. Boom, he gets the knee injury. And now he does come back in that game, but you could tell that it hampered him for a few weeks after that. There was a slowdown from him. So Zay Jones in year two, we already know he's starting off on a bad note with knee surgery in the offseason. Is he going to be 100% by training camp? Not sure. Is he going to be 100% by week one? I think it's important. But more important, I think it's he's at least healthy enough to be on the field during training camp because he's going to need to build a rapport with whatever quarterback that's out on the field because he simply did not have it with Tyrod Taylor last year. Yeah, um, that's a great point that you bring up with the Carolina game because something like that that early in your in your rookie season, I mean, that's got to stay in the, in the back of your mind yeah. going forward. And then – the reaction on Twitter that he got with the, oh, is it Tyrod's fault? Is it Zay's fault? Um, you know he was getting mentions that probably were worse than mine with the Jim Kelly thing. So, <laughs> but, um, I mean, that had to play a role. And then I'm t I was talking to his father, actually, on the podcast because we had, had an interesting interaction, as he does with just about everybody. But um, he was talking about Zay having a shoulder injury that he played through all year as well. So it seemed like every time he had an opportunity to kind of, establish himself he had to take a step back for something that really wasn't in his control to begin with and i don't think you, you could write him off just yet i mean you look at him at ecu most catches all time i think it's like 399 or something um his combine was crazy i don't think he's gonna play as ridiculous as this combine was but i think that he could be a contributor for the offense and i don't think that his rookie season is something where you could say oh this guy is terrible and he's not gonna be able to do anything because i do think that he has a future I do too, and, and I think he needs to be put in better positions, but I think he also needs a quarterback who's willing to throw him the ball. More importantly, I think he needs a quarterback that can throw him the ball accurately and give him an opportunity to make plays after the catch. And, and you know, the, the subtle things with Taylor last season that, you know, whether it was a crossing route that he was throwing behind guys or at their feet, um, or even, you know, eight to 10 yard hook routes where the ball was um, high or off to the side or into the um into the defender like things like that make a difference especially for a young receiver who is sort of acclimating to the speed of the game that to me is the biggest jump that wide receivers have to make it's from year one to year two and you didn't see it in the last few draft classes i mean after the was it the 2015 draft class where it was uh treadwell um i'm trying to think of the the kid from Doxon, or was that the 2016 yeah, I, I think it was 16 right 16th draft class like they right they really really struggled i mean treadwell didn't even see the field his rookie season Mike Williams and then and right exactly so you have all these guys that really struggled their rookie season it's not just that 2014 draft class was really an anomaly it's kind of why i wanted to start it with it because i wanted to sort of tie it into what you can expect from zay jones 
if he is going to take a step forward, because I think that's important to look at history and you see other draft classes outside of that 2014 class really struggle up into sometimes even year three. Right. That 2014 wide receivers and then the 2011, pretty much everything where everyone's a pro bowler. I don't think that you're, I think that people will kind of look at those as their pinpoints and like, like Bill's fans will with Brady with the take a quarterback all the time. But, um, like you said, Zay's got to make a jump. I mean, he's he was playing hurt. Everything was going against him pretty much for the entire year, but he didn't exactly have the best offseason uh, with that happening and the two surgeries. Yeah. But um, we can hope for the best and just look at the draft and say these guys got to get better somehow. But uh, right now, it's not looking too great. Yeah, and I mean, it'll be interesting, too, where they decide to put Jeremy Curley in this offense because I do think that Zay Jones is probably best fit in the slot. Um, right. His skill set, what he brings to the table, his maybe lack of top end speed, but nuance for outrunning. Like those are the sort of things that I think really make him an ideal fit in the slot. But Jeremy Curley right now uh, in the offseason, um, in the offseason training, has looked really comfortable in the starting role that they've been giving. And it looks like he's been playing exclusively in the slot. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. The other guy I really wanted to get into, and, and obviously Peterman and, and Tanner Vallejo are two guys in this draft cast. And, and maybe Peterman's worth talking a little bit about. I think Vallejo is mostly going to be. Um, you know, a depth player and potentially special team uh, player for this team. But Matt Milano, and, and obviously a guy you're familiar with and familiar never defending, him. never heard of him. <laughs> um, but Milano, to me, is maybe the most interesting player of last year's draft class, specifically because I don't think a lot of people expected to, for him to have the success he had. And specifically, what he's going to do with the additional and I think significant increase in playing time from last year because I think a lot of people don't forget that Ramon Humber was the starter really up until week four or five when he got hurt and then even when Ramon Humber was out of the lineup you know they weren't playing Milano 50 snaps a game he was still getting eased into it up, up until the end of the season with that additional workload this year what are you expecting to see from Milano in this defense in a defense that really is going to be far more versatile than it was last year yeah I think he's going to be um not probably close to a household name by the end of the season because I mean if you watch his Boston College film he really was the same player I mean he doesn't he's not the fastest but the, his instincts and just the way he can sniff out a play um, he's always around the ball it's just it's just something that you don't see from linebackers all the time um, he's a converted safety so he's really good in coverage he could run um, he's athletic and he's really the new age linebacker uh, like 220. 225 pounds, but um, it was baffling to me that Ramon Humber was able to stay on the field and keep getting that playing time once they saw him. Uh, you got to understand, obviously, Frazier easing him in as a fifth rounder, but at the same time, just from an athletic standpoint and seeing how fast he was coming along, I would have thrown him in earlier, but his contributions on special teams as well, I just think that the sky's the limit for him. You just saw kind of a glimpse of what he can be. And with Tremaine Edmonds next to him now, it's just they got a lot of speed. And and what I like too, and and I think for both of those guys, a guy like Lorenzo Alexander, although his on field performance um in terms of playing strong side linebacker might be starting to diminish. I think his role in terms of what he can do as a pass rusher, but more importantly, as a veteran leader, to those two young guys this year, I think will be paramount to both of their success. But you know, especially with Tremaine uh, Edmonds and what he can do his rookie year, but I think more importantly, Matt Milano and how he'll react to that playing time and that additional role and, and sort of what this team's going to expect from him. I think Lorenzo Alexander is going to have a big role in sort of guiding both of those players. Yeah, I don't think there's a player that could be more important to the uh, development of those two than Alexander because, I mean, you see him and if you talk to him, I mean, he cares about the team and he's going to help out. He's not trying, he's not Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers over right. here trying to hang on for another year. He wants these guys to get better. Um, and he's going to do whatever's asked of him. So, I mean, he's 15 years older than Edmonds right now, which is crazy to think about. But, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> seriously. But, um, yeah, so I think just having him in that room and teaching him how to be a professional and and the scheme and adjusting to it, it's, it's going to be really important and really help the development of the defense as a whole. So if you're just tuning in, Nate Geary, Rob Quinn here. We've been uh, we talked a little bit about the 2014 draft class and how Kelvin Benjamin fits in. Uh, just got into the the 2017 Bills draft class and how they'll um, and what they'll be expected from 
uh, in year two. And, I, and now I kind of wanted to talk about since we, we tied in a little bit about, um, you know, where Calvin Benjamin potentially fits in 2019. I think it's also important to maybe talk a little bit about Le'Veon Bell and his current situation. It, it seems like, Rob, that Le'Veon's going to be a free agent next year um, after taking another uh, another franchise tag this year. Certainly going to make a lot in guaranteed money. I think uh, 16, I think, like, this year. I think it's like 14 and a half. 14, yeah, something yeah. like that. So he's going to make a decent amount of money this year at, on the salary, or I'm sorry, on the franchise tag. But it's pretty clear his representation are, are going to be looking uh, forward to maybe moving on from Pittsburgh next year. With all of that cap space, too, I just wonder, um, obviously, LeSean McCoy is still, uh, at least right now, is what we know is, is still a staple here in Buffalo. He's still under contract for one more year. Um, but he is on the other side of 30. Um, and will be next year when his final year of his contract is up, and he will be the highest paid running back in the league with that ca- uh, that salary cap number and a in a pretty minimal dead cap hit if they decide to move on from him. I think Le'Veon Bell is a really interesting name because I look at how Brandon Beats tried to build this team and how he's trying to build his offense, and his predecessor, um, and or I should say, his successor. How they built Carolina, you know, whatever. They (laughs) paid the running back position. He was there when they paid D'Angelo Williams. They were there when they paid Jonathan Stewart. Right. So, like, that's a team that valued the running back position and what it brings to an offense. Could you see a four-year deal where the Bills throw a significant amount of money at a guy like Le'Veon Bell, knowing their quarterback's on a rookie deal? And (laughs) what better player would there be in the league to put next to a rookie quarterback like or a first-year starter in Josh Allen in 2019? Yeah, Bell is a unique, unique running back for today's NFL. He's one of the best in the in the league, probably outside of David Johnson. Um, just his size and the way he can split out into the slot and make plays in the passing game um, as a running back. But the only thing I, I would be concerned about is just his workload. I mean, I, we had those same concerns about Shady when he got to Buffalo. So, um, I mean, I don't know about spending – 16 million dollars on a running back i don't think teams are really trying to do that anymore. you see, you see yeah. though here's the thing rob like and i agree with him and his representation in this is yeah. that he should be paid for what he does on the field not the position oh, yeah. group that he plays in because he's a player that can he can be a thousand and a thousand guy if you wanted to yeah. be. and I, mean, yeah, I just 80 90 catch 80 something right. 90 catches last year so i agree with that but i'm saying the nfl as a whole um like, look at DeMarco Murray, I think it was a couple of years ago, and when he had, like, 1,800 yards, uh, 12, 15 touchdowns, something, he got $8 million a year. I just don't think teams are want to be the team to go out and put that high price on a running back, even though his – like his agent said, you pay the player, not the position. So it'll be interesting. I mean, I would def- I don't think there's a team in the league that would say no to Le'Veon Bell, but, like, with the Steelers, um, it's going to come down to just the money that he wants – Plus the suspensions and yeah, yeah, that, that, that's that, a good that point too. Yeah. yeah, no, there there are a lot of factors to Le'Veon Bell, and I think it maybe makes him one of the more polarizing players in all the league. Is you know how do teams see him? And, and you look at a guy like David Johnson. I think he's the next sort of guy that's going to really be in line for a big payday outside the scope of the running back position. Because when you have guys like him, um, Le'Veon Bell. Uh, I'll even throw Ezekiel Elliott in there. Um, guys that are so important to the success of their team and their offenses that they do so much more than just take handoffs. They're, mm-hmm. they're guys that are contributing in the pass game. And in today's NFL, a guy like Le'Veon Bell, who can take a two yard pass play or a, a screen pass or a, a be your safety valve. That's so important. And obviously we've seen the last two, three years, what LaShawn McCoy has done as that player. But I think more so to a certain extent that Le'Veon Bell sort of signifies that new group of running back that sort of does it all, but also plays with power, plays with finesse. More importantly, he plays with the most patience we've ever seen out of a runner in, in NFL history. Yeah, um, and I know I've seen a couple of people on tw- on Twitter are saying that he was a product of the Steelers having Antonio Brown and Ben Roethlisberger. I think that's ridiculous, but um, you make a good point with the way that the running backs are coming back with like Gurley and Elliott and David Johnson. I mean, these guys are coming out. So maybe I forgot I'm, about Gurley. Holy cow! Yeah. yeah. But um, they're coming out every year, and they're getting taken high. And we, they, people were saying the same thing: "Oh, don't draft these guys high because they're running back." So, I mean, maybe uh, Bean coming from Carolina saying, "Let's give a whole an entire backfield of Williams and Stewart 50, 60 million dollars each." When that was huge money, uh, taking a swing at Bell and saying, "Let's get this offense is going with a guy like that." So. And, and you know, and I also you know like 
some of the conversation that's happening in our in our chat right now about you know maybe drafting a guy high because you want a guy that maybe doesn't have the miles that Le'Veon does on him. But you know, you talk about Le'Veon; he's had a couple suspensions. I think more than anything, LaShawn McCoy and Le'Veon Bell, they may be the two best players that I can remember, other than Barry Sanders, at eluding contact when contact is inevitable, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. when contact's inevitable, LaShawn McCoy finds a way to sidestep and get out of bounds or to fall right before the contact comes. Right. And, you know, say what you will growing up, like guys like that that maybe shy away from contact a little bit, that were great players. Maybe they had some shit talking about them, but like those guys are playing longer careers. Like they're guys like that, especially at the running back position. I think it's so important to figure out ways to avoid hits to elongate your career. And LaShawn McCoy's proof that it's possible that if you can't take hits or if you don't take big hits or you can minimize them, that you can prolong your career and, you know, stop the, the, the talk of they have too many miles on their, you know, on their barometer. Right. I mean, remember Marion Barber, for, had that stretch for like two, three years. He was just running people over, but then he just disappeared because he had injuries that mounted up. And but I remember when Shady got here with the whole, everyone was looking at those numbers and the doing the analytics on how many carries and touches he had. And I, that was a concern of mine too, about how long he would last. But obviously it's not an issue. And he got like Bell that's like 30 pounds bigger and right. massive dude. Um, I mean, I, I would love the – thought of him in the offense, but it, it'll go down to the money in the contract, but mm -hmm. most importantly, the suspension, because we saw what happened with Darius, and I think their situations would be kind of similar in that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about the last thing I wanted to catch uh, before we uh, before we get going for the evening. Darrell Rivas uh, announces his retirement today from football, and, and I say RIP gone too soon. It's too bad because he was such an effective player um, and really, quite honestly, Rob, uh, maybe a guy that doesn't give it enough respect and maybe being one of the best of all time at his craft. Um, to me, there are certain guys that play the game and play that position. The first guy that pops out to me, Ty Law, a guy that plays the game um, better than anyone during their time. You know, like it sticks out to me as being I mean, everybody talks about Revis Island like that. that that's what Revis started. So talk a little bit about your thoughts as he moves on to whatever is probably broadcasting career he'll pick up next or whatever. And I'm sure we probably won't be hearing the last of Darrell Rivas, but, um, you know, watching the Bills for as long as we have and, and sort of having him torment for a lot of that time. But then at the end, sort of being a shell of himself, like that, that Monday night football game or the Thursday night game pops out to me where, you know, Marquise Goodwin just ran right past him or a couple of those games against the the Bills where Sammy Watkins really sort of put him on his turntiles or turnstile. So, you know, talk a little bit about his career and your thoughts as he uh, as he ends it and hangs up the cleats. Yeah, I think Revis is the best cornerback I've watched in in my time watching football. I mean, just the way that he took away an entire side of the field, especially with Rex as the coordinator, when he was not going to be afraid to send to do run cover zero and send an all out blitz because he knew that that Revis was there and he was capable of shutting down anybody and had put that confidence in him that he could, but you watched him and he was just so good. And you see corners like Sherman or Deion Sanders and how flashy and how outspoken they were. Um, you didn't really hear Revis talk at all. He yeah. just kept his mouth shut and as the best player, arguably in the league outside of the quarterbacks and everything. I mean, he was ridiculous. And I, don't think that people will see that until – but if you look at his numbers, they are incredible. Um, he was breaking out like 25 passes a year while he was getting thrown at like 35, 40 times. I think it, pro football focus had him. I'll have to pull him up. But they were just, just crazy for a stretch of time with Rex. Yeah, and, you know, it was unfortunate that he sustained that knee injury when he did because I think he was playing at the prime of his career – and the knee injury took a lot. It, it, that effectively was the beginning of the end for Rebus. And it was unfortunate because certain guys rely on their legs in certain positions more than others. And, and you talk about like wide receivers as being guys that really rely on their legs and being healthy and being 100%. And Rebus clearly lost a step after that. And it was unfortunate because as much as, you know, I hated watching the Bills go up against him, he really was – no drama, as I think um, John in the chat, or Frank it was, 
um, in our chat saying, you know, like he wasn't drama. He wasn't out there um, being Jalen Ramsey where he was getting into fights with AJ Green during a game. He was going out there. He was the best. But he didn't have to rub it in anybody's face. And I think I, I'll um, walk away or, or, or watch him walk away with respect for the guy, even though they, the Bills played him twice a year for almost a decade. Um, and I was pretty sick of him after a while. But um, he's going to go off as maybe, uh, I think, a first ballot Hall of Famer and well-deserving. Yeah, unquestioned. I just pulled it up just as just as regular stats. 108 games with the Jets. He broke up 111 passes with 25 picks. So, I mean, that's – and that's what no one's throwing at him either. So, I mean, just the player. It's like, like that. It re he reminds me sort of the Barry Bonds of football because, you know, during that year, I mean, whatever. I mean, he did steroids, but he was getting one hittable pitch, two hittable pitches a series, and he was sending them yard. And the same thing with Revis is he was getting one or two throws his way a game, and he was, ta he was making the most of it, which to me, uh, well, that'll always stand out to me is I can't believe he had 25 interceptions in, what, nine years? Uh, yeah, something like like eight years, not yeah, eight yeah. seasons. So he yeah, was just crazy, a, a great player. But if, Stevie Johnson probably says different, but yeah, he Stevie, was the only one that has it, had his number. Stevie <laughs> and Sammy both had their number. Uh, both had Revis's number off the line of scrimmage. But right after the line of scrimmage, when they're going downfield, Revis always had him on lockdown. But it was sort of right. that those first four steps off the line of scrimmage. Um, that Stevie and Sammy always seem to make him look like a fool at times. So, <laughs> well, anyways, uh, that's going to do it for us tonight on Cover One Buffalo. As Rob mentioned, he'll have some workout on Cover One.net this week. Um, you can take a look. I'll have some stuff up next week as training camp opens your training camp primer. So, I'll have that up next week. You can check those both out, Cover One.net. Don't forget to download the app up at the Cover One, uh, the Cover One app up at the uh, Apple iTunes Store. And of course, uh, the Droid Store Marketplace as well. So for me, Nate Geary, Rob Quinn, another edition of Cover One Buffalo. Until next week, we will see you later.